Hello, 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 welcome. Welcome back. Hey, how's it going, guys? Oh, yeah, just the camera. There we go. How are you guys doing? Welcome back to Building Worlds. Uh, welcome, welcome. You can see there are some people already on the stream. Cool. Oh, let me know if the audio, the music is too loud. Maybe it's hot, right? The audio on my end. There we go. Cool. All right. So let's go over where we're at with this at the moment. And if I don't know if some people. Oh, okay, it's too loud. Okay. How about now? Is it better? Sounds just better. Okay. Cool. Okay. I'm guessing. I'm assuming it's it's better. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. So uh, going back to this. Uh, well, not last week. A couple weeks ago, we sculpted this sort of block out cliff thingy, which is a little weird. <laughs> and it changed a little bit like I don't know if you guys watched my own stream last week uh, for those of you that watch uh, we basically went into Unreal and did like a first lighting pass and a block out in Unreal and then we sort of settled that we're gonna have a more blocky ish kind of like cliff formation more rock more boxy so I'm going to redo this. This is actually still, it might still be useful, but I'm going to actually sculpt one rock formation. This was the block out from last week. So, and you can see it's all still very low poly. It's just the, the general shape formation. And we got some platforms here, some angles, and I'm going to show you how I use that sort of workflow to start going to town and having some fun here okay so oh that's so sweet <laughs> thank you so let's assume that this is the finished block out because I want to try I'm, gonna, I'm emphasizing the word try because it's environment art right I'm going to try to have a rock formation sort of sculpted and then I'm going to do the game ready asset inside a ZBrush with UVs, everything ready to go. So next week on our my separate stream, we're going to do the Unreal part of it and we're going to bring that in, do some textures and start actually carving out the environment. And so Again, as you guys might know, I do love me some... Oh, Jesus. For some reason, there's... The Pure Ref is taking... I have my Pure Ref over here. You know, it's taking on a little bit of the screen there. Okay. And my custom hotkeys were not showing up. Okay. So, do you please provide me with a file of your interface and a file of your camera view? Well... I can show you how you set up a cam view. That's that I can do. And uh, you, what do you mean work interface? You mean like this layout here? All right. If you want, if you want, if you want to, I can show you how you can set up your own cam view and do the interface like the custom interface, like I that I have here. Because uh, to be honest, I don't really care much about this whole thing around me. All I care about is this and my custom menu. I have everything on my custom menu, as you can see here, right? Everything I need is docked in separate custom menus. And even the brushes, like the most used brushes are all here. Well, I forgot to name this one, but I know what it is, so. 
if you want to do that, that is a f that's fairly simple. It's much more simpler in ZBrush than in any other software I know. So if you want to create a custom menu, basically what you have to do is you have to go over here to the custom UI. Where is the custom UI? Yeah, custom UI. And you have to create a new menu, right? But first and foremost, you have to enable customize. If you enable customize, that means you can drag any button, anything you see on the interface, you can drag it around the interface, right? Let me just do this because that looks awful. <laughs> okay, so, ah, oh, Jesus, my keyboard. I have big fingers. <laughs> so sometimes I click the wrong button, but yeah. So as long as the enable customize is on, you can create a new menu and eventually, well, a menu, let's call it a palette, right? So it's basically one of these that you see on top of here. You're gonna create your own separate one. And you can see my own custom menu is right here, brush holder. This is my brush holder, this is custom. And then there's the, uh, what, what is it called? Uh, I don't remember, it's just my custom menu. <laughs> like it's control V, it's here, sculpture. I call it sculpture, but you know, you can call it whatever you want. So let me just do that. All right, so I create a new menu and you have to type in your name. Let's call this demo menu for now, right? You don't need to call that, you know, demo menu, but you call this demo menu and now you can see it popped a new palette here or a menu, right? Depends on what you want to call it. So if you click here, it, it doesn't have anything. It's all empty, right? And now since you're in enable customize, you can drag and drop. Let's say I want to, I want to drag this button or whatever. So what I usually do is I open up a separate docking tab here and I bring in that custom menu, oh, okay. So it reorders that uh, by naming convention. So D is around here, dynamics, draw, draw, demo menu. So if you drag and drop this here, it's open because you look at that icon and it pops out. The icon pops out every time it's open because you can't really tell because it doesn't have anything. But if the icon is popped out like that, I don't know if you can see on the stream, but it's popping out the, the little uh, the little button there so you pop it out and you're in enable customize that means let's say I want this duplicate button for some reason to be on my menu control alt drag and you can see it highlighted the menu and you let go and now this is part of your menu right and you can have anything here let's say I want the delete button as well maybe some subdivision control so i want to have the divide button um, and let's push this down always control alt, alt is hold down right you hold down control alt and then you click and drag so and then you go to smooth maybe some smooth and then the subdivisions you can actually have that here underneath and you can even it's better i prefer it at least to use this workflow because you can reorganize the menus according to your own workflow, right? So let's say you usually go Dynamesh and there's a bunch of features that you're using in Dynamesh. You clump those together and then you make a little separation there. Let's say next I'm gonna have my Ziri Mesher. I don't know, you know, Ziri Mesher, right? So what you wanna do is actually you have these little buttons here. These are blank spaces that allow you to sort of customize the, the let's say the org organize the, the old buttons very neatly in your menu. So let's drag this one here. And okay, so this sometimes, all right. So now if you turn off customize, you can see what that is doing. Like if you turn off customize, it's nothing there. Let's turn it on again and let's add the zero measure button. As I use that a little bit when I'm projecting details and doing all that stuff. All right, so now maybe I want the same and the half. This is usually the two ones I use. And maybe you want the keep groups button. I always use keep groups because it allows me to keep the edge loops I want. Is this live? Yes, it is live. Yeah, I'm here. Hello. <laughs> I am here. Yeah, I'm gonna show you that in a second. Just give me a second, all right? This is even easier actually. So I'm gonna use this rock. Actually, we could use the other one from the other week to create a, a nice cam, little cam view. Ian Robinson has a nice tutorial on that. I actually learned this from him 
uh, he has a nice tutorial because he used to stream with a, a Majin Vegeta, I think it was Majin Vegeta's head uh, on the corner. And I was like, I wonder how that is, how that works, <laughs> you know? So, so I learned it from him, but I can show you real quick. That's, that's no problem. And so, all right. So let's say you have all this. And now if you go to preferences and you turn off enable customize, you can see there's like an empty space there. And now the trick is, if you have the enable customize off, off, okay, and you press control alt and then click, not click and hold, click. If you click it, you see, you can see here, look at this text right here, right? If I control alt and then click and don't move anything, right? ZBrush is waiting for you to input your hotkey, right? So let's say I want control H. All right, this is already assigned. All right, so if I press control alt, let's say control two. And now if I press control two, when I'm outside of that menu, control two, there's my menu. So I assign the hotkey to that menu that I just created with the buttons that I want. And here's a cool little thing. So let's say this is my uh, clean up or clean topology um, menu. In when you enable customize, you create a custom sub palette you basically control alt and drag that custom sub palette here and now you have a separate sub palette which i'm gonna maybe bring in maybe i'm gonna basically oops i control alt click if you control alt click it deletes that thing so one thing you want to do is let's say i want to have dynamesh there for some reason where's dynamesh there it is uh, Dynamesh, I want it to go over here. There's Dynamesh. Maybe the Groups button, I use that a lot. Uh, the Blur button, I want to control the Dynamesh Blur. And the Resolution. The Resolution should be on the bottom. And, uh, and there it is, all right? So this is my menu for Dynamesh. And now if I turn off Enable Customize, there's our menu. And, whoops. Ah. Uh, oh, not this one, sorry. I'm gonna do the whole thing, control two. And now you have your custom menu. So if you press control two, there's your menu. Well, there's two of them actually. But if you press this, this is a sub palette that we just created, all right? With the custom menu. So this is what I'm using when I'm creating my own custom menus and I have all the features that I use here. Masking features with polygroups and edge loops slash, um, slash, uh, group loops and and panel loops all together because I use this on hard surface I use this a lot like the masking and the auto groups button so it's all clumped together a good example of this is when you go to you want to have like mirror and mirror and weld traditionally they're on two very separate locations right so mirrors in modified to mirror and weld is in modified topology I'm sorry and, de and in deformation, you find mirror. But usually I use those two in conjunction. So in my custom menu, I just bring those over together and I have them neatly packed next to each other. So I don't have to go scrolling up and down. So it just saves a lot of time in the long run, right? So now for the cam view. So let's say you, in your cam view, you wanna have, oh, I really like this model. I don't, right? Because uh, I'm, you know, imposter syndrome and all that. So let's let's actually look at this sword, right? So what you want to do is you want to hide everything that you don't want to see, right? Because it's gonna make a, basically it's rendering, right? Yeah, definitely, definitely, yeah, yeah. That's it's not a lifesaver, you know. It's not like you die or whatever <laughs> when you when you don't do that. But it is it is a very a time saving thing to keep in mind that. If you save like, let's say 10 seconds, every time you do that, or five seconds, uh, even two seconds, just imagine the amount of times you press that button in a project and then multiply that by those two five seconds and watch as the hours that you save on the long run, right? Now, if you add to that all the other buttons in the palettes in ZBrush that you use, because this is very personal, like a lot of people don't use this the same way I do, uh, I mean, it's very particular to the individual. So everyone has their own workflows, right? And everyone likes to use certain combinations of features. 
So that's why I always show, at least in my students, how to do custom menus, because that's a time saver, and not just a time saver, it allows you to actually learn the interface, right? And because that's because you need to know where everything is and how how to combine features in order to create your own custom menu. Because if you want to create your own custom menu, you pack features together that you're going to use together for a specific case scenario in your projects, in your artistic uh, endeavors, right, in ZBrush. And so if you're creating a custom menu with that in mind, then you need to know how to combine those features in the first place, right? So, all right, so let's say, let's do this for the sword. So this is a little chaotic, but I know it's that one. So let me just do this, this. I want to show everything except the cliffs and all that block out nonsense that we did. All right, so this is what I want to render because technically that's what it is. It's going to render this. And uh, when you what you want to do is you want to go to preferences. And then you want to go over to cam view. Where's cam view? Cam view. There it is. And this is very simple. So if you want to have this object as it is on the document on your canvas, right? Uh, like it is being shown here, you just go over there and you click make cam view, right? And what it's going to do is it's actually going to do a render of everything from all sides. And now you can see there's my sword on the corner. Right. All right. I want to turn off the floor because it actually captures the floor, right? So shift P and there's the floor gone. And now I want to do the, that thing again. So make cam view and there it is. So now we have the sword there. All right. So, but one thing that you might need to do is you want to actually render this first. So if you click render, it's going to give me, I don't know, I didn't set the settings or whatever, but let's say this is what I want, this look, right? After you tweak the materials, you tweak whatever, because you can see my Majin Buu has like color and all that, right? But this one, this one doesn't have it, but let's say we're tweaking the materials and we make a nice render. It's going to take longer. I advise you to turn on, turn down this S pixel, sub pixel anti-aliasing render quality. This speeds up your render time significantly. Like. You, you saw it took like 10, uh, three seconds or two seconds. If you click render now, it's basically instant, right? So just turn this down. And to be honest, that size of the cam view, you're never going to see like any aliasing or whatever. So it doesn't really matter. So let's render this out. And now with this render, don't move the camera. If you move the camera, renders off, right? So you go to preferences, cam view, make cam view. And it's going to take a little longer because it's a couple of seconds per uh, pose, let's say. And uh, and at the end, we're going to have a nice little cam view. And this is again, this isn't uh, this isn't anything special. I learned this with with Ian. He made a, a tutorial online. You can find this on uh, I think it's either on his own channel or on ZBrush channel here on ZBrush live because at the time he was still uh, streaming uh, on his own channel as well so I can't really remember where that was but yeah definitely and I remember asking him that live and he so there it is there's my sword on the corner right and you can switch the cam view just by going over here and clicking next so we have a bunch of them that are default with ZBrush, come packed with ZBrush, right? And uh, yeah, there's my Majin Buu. And uh, there we go. Right? Majin Buu, let's go back to Majin Buu. So I hope that was useful. Uh, did that, I mean, yeah. Did that answer your question? Do you know now how to make a camp view? <laughs> so now we can, you can, even if you, if you don't remember all the steps, just remember that this stream is going to be uh, stored on YouTube, uh, a little bit on Twitch, on, on the VODs, but that, that is gone after a while. So if you want to, if you want to go back and rewatch that old section, just to know how to make your own cam views, then feel free to go back, you know? But that's basically it. So nothing really like special. 
Oh, I had a view um, set. All right. You're welcome. Happy to help. All right, so first, let's go over this again, right? So this is our uh, block out of the rock formation. And the, the whole point of having this a separate thing and as a single piece, you would sort of do that uh, for 3D printing. Definitely, you would do that for 3D printing. Eventually, you have to sort of have everything watertight and, you know, because it's 3D printing. But for games, usually, it's a good idea to have like a modular piece that you can just, in the engine, just switch around and maybe add the variation in the texture level and the material level. And the model, because the models require draw calls and that costs memory. And, you know, so there's everything that's associated with memory costs, optimization, and all that. And one of the cool things is that even if you're not taking into account optimization, because we're not, because we're not building an actual game, we're, um, well, I mean, I'm not doing this for Xbox or PlayStation or whatever, you know what I mean? So it's just for me in my portfolio, right? So, but if you want to take that into account, like even if you don't mind the optimization side, like let's say this is for animation or visual effects, it is a good idea to keep modularity in mind because it allows you for faster iteration uh, down the pipe. So let's say your art director or someone decides to change the, the, the overall shape of the, of the cliff or whatever. If you have a modular rock that's spread around to create that formation, you can easily in-engine just tweak that. But if it's all a single sculpted model and the art director decides to change something, then you have to re-sculpt the whole thing and re-topo the whole thing and bake again. And you, you can see where I'm going with this, right? So uh, it's usually a good idea to keep modularity in mind, regardless if it's games, animation, visual effects, whatever. Uh, of course, you still have to have that uniqueness to a single piece because you have to to break the repetition in some way. And there's multiple tricks for that. Right, I'm gonna work with the crease and dynamic subdivisions because I'm a, a little bit of a dynamic nerd. And I'm gonna look at this and try to figure out if there is a way for me to improve this a little bit. So, and this is the cool thing about working with polygroups, right? Because you can just go over, wow, that is not, uh, correct. There we go. Um, the cool thing about working with polygroups is that you can, and especially if you're in a very low poly um, stage, you can easily just uh, adjust things. Well, maybe something like that. Yeah, you can easily adjust things and you can also tweak stuff on the fly and also polygroups allow me for um, allow me to select um, oh you mean that no I bought those <laughs> no I didn't print those yeah those are bought the, there's there's Goku and Vegeta there there's like Super Saiyan 2 Goku and Majin Vegeta and there's Goku versus Frieza and there's a little Vegeta there that's a little scared is on the corner right <laughs> No, I wish I printed those. I have a couple of artists that I follow that do incredible 3D printing works, uh, especially in the Dragon Ball franchise, because as you can tell, probably, I'm a big Dragon Ball fan. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, I could show you, but it's not mine, you know? Like, so, what, what's the... You want to see them? I mean, they're not even like collector's edition or whatever. I don't really care for that. I just love the figures. I don't even care about the, let's say, the collector's aspect of it, right? It's just the, the figures themselves that, that I enjoy and the, the actual franchise, you know? And, okay, so what you're seeing here basically is... Uh... Oh, you can't tell at all. Is that sarcasm? <laughs> yeah. Oh well. It's probably my cam view. Not at all the hundreds of figures <laughs> that I have for Dragon Ball. It's the cam view. Definitely the cam view. Right. 
So one cool thing about polygroups, you can see that suddenly it masked everything. That's because I'm using control click. So if you're using polygroups, it's essentially like having sub sub tools, right? So you have your own sub tools and then in that sub tool, if you have everything separated by polygroups, you can either select them or if you're in the gizmo, control click and it just selects, well, masks everything except for those polygroups. And now I'm going to my handy dandy, uh, you know, menu and auto groups allows me to have everything that's not connected into the same mesh it's gonna have its own polygroup so and there we go and we're gonna go over here I'm gonna try to make this a little better Sorry if I'm clicking outside, Paul. I don't know if you see this, but if you see this, I'm sorry. It's my tablet. It's not working properly. <laughs> right? My button here is all messed up because I usually, oh, you see, like I, I click, I right click, but I, it still doesn't want to work properly for some reason. So yeah, it's on my tablet because I'm usually a uh, right click fanboy. Right click army. Right. There we go. There we go. I want to look at this in that manner. And uh, this doesn't taper that much. But again, like it, once I'm subdivided, I can always just go over here to my deform deformers, actually taper. And uh, taper this down, and then just bulk it up a little bit. And have sort of a slight taper there. It doesn't taper that well because it's, it's very low poly. You know, like, it doesn't have the geometry to bend properly. I'm gonna probably run, again, another one. But it still does the job. I wanted to have like a a, a thicker base a base or you know because this is going to be rotated and all of that so one of the cool things that we need to think about is are we gonna have this should be flatter though because of the whole modularity aspect to it yeah we're gonna do that anyway so let's try this let's try this block out i usually duplicate and then i start because if you want to have another variation you keep that right and the naming is all over the place. Forget that for now. Um, I don't usually forget that for now because especially in games you want to have like for baking and all that, like the proper naming convention. But, you know, whatever. So let's apply this. Apply dynamic subdivision and maybe divide it once more. And now go to resolution, drag and drop to see Let's go over here to this little corner there. Maybe, hmm, where can I get the most? There we go, 80, right? And I wanna keep groups. So if you Dynamesh with a keep groups button, where's Dynamesh? The groups here, multi-group Dynamesh. That means it won't weld unless you have the same group, right? And that's what I want for now, oops. Okay, let's delete lower, usually delete lower. Groups and the resolution again should be like 88 seems fine. And again, 88 does a lot of density because this is big. It's a big mesh, right? So DynaMesh is dependent on the size of your mesh. So if the, the mesh is bigger, because you have to think of DynaMesh as sort of like a grid on your document that is projecting that topology, let's say, onto the surface. That's why when you are you have like weird corners, if everything is like flat 90 degrees, then that's fine. But if you have like a weird tapered corner, you're eventually gonna get some aliasing. You can see there, some aliasing going on. It's not aliasing, but it's like a stair effect um, that's technically caused by aliasing. So, you know, and 
so but this in this case we don't really care so let me just i'm gonna actually reduce this because this is a little too much Ooh, wow okay mm. why is this going? okay yeah it's a graphics card issue okay so they're still separate you can see this piece is all is still separate so what we're gonna do is go over to our fancy brushes right over here and we're gonna start carving away I can actually s click dynamic Let me turn off dynamic and let's whoops just carve away at these sections Make this a little bigger. Just want to block this, make it look like a rock first, regardless of the shape, because we can always tweak that. And we can start, like, if this is isolated, this is the cool thing. Control click. And now if you go over to your clip curve brushes, remember to turn polygroups on. Actually, no, no polygroups on this case because we are using Dynamesh groups. Otherwise, it would create some issues there. So we can just start clipping. Mm, this was too much. It's five million polygons starting to... And... Start clipping those things. There we go. The rest we can actually sculpt that in. Mm. And this actually we can carve in the design before we even get to that section so double tap that double tap that yeah gonna create that issue right there but again redynamesh and voila and it's still a separate mesh right so same thing here I don't like this the silhouette I want to carve this in and start getting some rocky formations there I'm hoping we can get further than last week on this but let me know if you guys have any questions I don't mind asking answering them regardless this is a multi-stream endeavor guys there's no way to create an, a full environment in just a couple of streams and the sculpting part is kind of time-consuming the rest is just boring for most people <laughs> from what I understand like the retopo thing and you know but I'm gonna show you, that's what I actually wanna show you. A bunch of different ways that you guys can optimize your game art workflows in ZBrush to make it faster, more efficient, and way, way much more fun. So let me just, just hammer this down. This is technically a mallet, so we're hammering and cutting at our rock. So you have to sort of, that's why I like to use this workflow because I think of like, as if I am doing like marble carving, you know what I mean? Like this is a solid piece of rock and I need like to actually cut like a section and then just hammer it. So it's not, maybe not, not marble, 
but uh, let's say granite or something because marble is hard right so let's actually do this like so that doesn't matter because it's not going to be seen at least not from this angle and uh, I want to go BMN move infinite depth and let me just check if I have accu curve on no, I should though. Because now I can actually hand taper that. And uh, on the other side, we want to have some platforms to this side. Because in the game, if you want to have like various rotations to this uh, spread around the level, and uh, that would be nice. So. I'm gonna actually do like a couple of platforms like so. I wanna push this out a little bit. And that one, maybe I wanna push that out too. And we're gonna start cutting this. Gonna rotate this a little bit. Right. Let me just check something. Hmm. There we go. Now let's start chiseling away. I mean, I see a lot of our, uh, environment artists using the clay adaptive, uh, the trim adaptive. I'm sorry, trim adaptive brush. Okay, can you get away with decimating the mesh as much as possible and project the details to avoid my... Well, you can, but the problem is, unless you're doing what I'm going to be doing for you guys here, as sort of like the block out thing, uh, you can get away with a lot, a lot on, with the decimation, yes, but it's harder for you to control the UVs, unless unless you use a new couple of features in ZBrush that allow you to actually tell ZBrush where exactly do you want your UV seams to be. If there's a, a couple of new ways to cut seams in, in ZBrush. I used to do all my workflow with UV Master for that particular uh, workflow, you know, with the Decimation Master. Uh, but now, not anymore. So the cool, the cool thing is that usually you have to do manual retalpo, especially if it's a deformable mesh. So let's say I'm going to have uh, a crystal that deforms and then breaks apart. Whatever, like for effects. Like for our visual effects artist wants to do this cool effect and he wants a mesh because he want, he's going to deform that mesh using world position offset and maybe vertex deformations and stuff like that. If it's going to deform, it's going to be a little more evident, you know, the, the, the stretching and the seams, right? And if you... You don't want to have that, so you want to have your seams according to like the flow of the mesh, right? You want to do manual retopo. But if it's a static mesh like this one, you can actually get away with a lot just with decimation. That's it. And that's technically what I'll be doing. I won't do that for everything, especially like the we're going to have some steps. I have a whole list of props I want to do with you guys here. There's uh, two, one or two cliff rocks, one platform rock, which is those slabs that are like on top of each other, layered. Uh, smaller rocks, then there's like a tileable texture for cobblestone, tileable texture for a stone wall, then the altar piece, and then the steps. And for now, that's it. Probably vegetation as well, so probably a tree, a stylized tree or something. But I'm not really sure about that, so let's see. So. With the cliff rocks, maybe the platform rock as well, and the smaller rocks, definitely you can get away with Decimation Master. For the altar piece and the steps, I'll probably won't because I want to have clean UVs and, and clean topology for what I want to do, which is actually use those UVs, use that edge flow to create some cool effects, including like painting dirt on crevices and doing a lot of like edge highlight 
weird nonsense in Unreal, you know? So it all depends on what you're doing. Like, if it's just for a render, sure, you can get away with a lot of stuff. So if it's a props, does it also need a, to have a nice topology? Can you just use... Yeah, that's what I'm saying, right? So it depends on the prop, right? And you have to keep in mind as well, is this going to be... Because Decimation does a lot of, like, small and big triangles, depending on the surface area, right? So it depends on the normal variations to apply density. If you're, let's say it's a gun, right? And it, the gun has a lot of like contraptions that you move stuff around. And it's all our surface, right? So technically you could get away with estimation. But the problem is if it's a, for a first person shooter, the gun's going to be in your face. So it's good to have a lot of detail, but you have to keep in mind that then you're going to have to smoothen the normals you know, and, and control the normal direction of the actual mesh. And that is going to come through with, you know, there's going to look like there's like errors in the normals because there's a lot of small triangles and big triangles. And it's very, very hard to do that in like Maya or Cinema 4D because of the smaller triangles. So it's harder to select those edges. And there's no like a clean edge, right? So for like, if you're doing hard surface, I wouldn't. I wouldn't do the, the decimation. Zero mesh, yes. But there's a bunch of things that you can do with Zero mesh to give you the exact results that you want or very close to it. And and that is the... Yeah, so definitely you can have your own... like You can tell Zero mesh uh, what, um, what, where you want the edge loops. You can tell Zero mesh where you want more density, less density. And, th and you can get away with a lot on that. I would say if it's like a hero piece, you know, like a hero center piece or whatever, uh, I tend to do everything by hand because I really want to have like neat control over everything because that's going to be the center of attention, right? So everyone is going to be aware of any of the flaws that that model might have. But yes, you can definitely get away with a lot of that stuff. So long story short, Yes. <laughs> hey, how are you? I'm great. It's a nice Saturday here in Portugal. It's sunny. And uh, and I have a big window, so light comes in. And I love the sun. That's one cool thing about living in Portugal, is that there's sun, a lot of sun. So, I'm, yes, I'm very well. Thank you. Uh, let me just try to give the impression of it being a rock. One of the things that's important is to retain those harsh edges that are sort of like stylized-ish. Because that's going to come through in the curvature map when we bake those in substance. Uh, and we want to use that to our advantage when creating uh, the textures in substance. Because I want to do edge highlights to create that sort of like Blizzard-ish uh, Warcraft-like effect. Just fake a lot of the lighting, fake ambient occlusion in the, in the color, and then do the edge highlights in the color as well, the color channel. And we want to set that up for success already in the ZBrush stage, right? break up this piece over there and one thing that I might need to do is actually start chipping away at that now we can do this and now we have a Cool little rock formation there. As you can see, it's not it's not perfect. The Dynamesh can only go so far at this resolution. But I don't want to go too crazy with that because again, we're still blocking things up, and I want to have this be like a slab, have a slab sort of look, 
so you can go over there we go big platforms here and there whoops a daisy forgot to mask that Just gonna do some very basic. And I'm gonna probably do this. And now this, whoops. Come on. There we go. There's the cool thing. They're still separate, but now they match perfectly, and that's because of the. We want to have a little bit of intersections here. Like, you, we want these, like, interlockings between the small little features uh, to to feel more natural and less like Halo Infinite. You know, those those sort of like sci-fi, clearly not natural rocks, but that's because of the concept of the actual game. So we wanna... No, I am not a hard surface modeler. I do hard surface because I'm an environment artist. So environment artists and even, even character artists, I would say they need to know how to do, you know, props and weapons and armor and stuff like that and clothing and anatomy and all of that stuff right so environment artists do need to know an organic and art surface to a certain extent because let's say i'm modeling a sci-fi environment art right an environment that's like you know science fiction or maybe more architectural and realistic so there's a lot of hard surface everywhere Yes, this brush comes with ZBrush. It's it, it's not loaded as you start ZBrush. I just you, I brought it into the Z startup because I use it all the time. So in my ZBrush file, it's open all, at all times. It's loaded, but it's you can find it here under the brush lightbox brush. And there's the mallet brushes. Where's the M? Oh Jesus, my dyslexia is crazy today. Mallet. Uh, and I'm using Mallet Fast and Mallet Fast 2. It's basically a fancy version of Trim Adaptive, but you know, it, it gives you a much harsher result, which is exactly what I want for this, particularly in, uh, in stylized pieces. But I use this all the time for non stylized work as well. So, and you can tap, basically, you're tapping. Because it, this is a hammer, basically, it's a mallet, right? So you're tapping, and then if you just do this, for example, it's got to create a clean cut there. And this, and you can see, you can see stuff starting to appear now, like. It would and smooth things up and then just cut it even more and you can get some cool clean cuts like that Something like that you know so it's all about the design then the hardest part about making rocks is actually make them look natural it's harder to do rocks I feel than a lot of other stuff. I, I would say it's harder for me to do rocks than it is for to do weapons. You know, that's why I enjoyed it so much because I'm a I'm a masochist. So, <laughs> so that's basically me in a nutshell. What's your poly budget for environment? Pro Depends on the environment. Doing an open world environment, doing like a very contained small environment. You're doing uh, for PlayStation Five. You're doing it for Switch, or you're doing it for PC, or like people ask about poly budget all the time like that really depends on the platform and it depends on the type of game and it depends on what sort of target hardware are you aiming for right 
So if it's like a very linear game, and it's like, you know, corridors everywhere, like Resident Evil or something, like Resident Evil 2, the remake, I mean, then you can go crazier with with the detail and the in the modeling and even texturing. Because it's a very contained environment, right? So you have a lot of like uh, frustrum culling, backface culling, occlusion culling, and it's it's prov it's preventing the render engine to render everything that's like outside of that. So you can go a little crazier with the draw calls. But if you're doing like an open world environment, it's incredibly hard to optimize an open world environment. But I would say depending on the sort of prop as well. Is it just a small rock on the floor? Or is it going to be this huge cliff, right? So for this, for example, I try to set texel density. In this case, it's a 4K. It's basically uh, 10.24, which is uh, a 1K texture per every 100 meters. Because it's a portfolio piece, it's small. So first person shooter texel density seems to work fine. But that's the texturing side. For the modeling side, I would say this is kind of important because this is going to be on the side of the mountain and the mountain is definitely going to be the biggest. It, it will, let's say, fill the most of the screen. So that's one thing you have to keep in mind, like how much percentage of the screen is this prop going to going to occupy, right? And you can always go a little crazy with LODs as well. So you can you can say, okay, LOD number zero, when you're up close, right, and it fills X percent of the screen, it's going to have a lot of detail. But then as you go back, you can sort of, but that's hard, right? You can switch to the second LOD and have it very low poly, but that's going to create a popping effect. It's very hard to keep the silhouette in that uh, because it's still f close. So the player will notice the popping, right, uh, between uh, or a tree or whatever. So what you usually do is you take some artistic freedom and you do a lot of like texture magic and shader magic in, in the engine to make that less evident, like the, the popping between all of these. But that's only if you're like on a very tight budget. To be honest, like nowadays, the Series X and the PlayStation 5 are so powerful and it, they're becoming more powerful, let's say, because the engines are starting to optimize for next gen that poly budget's starting to become less of a factor, but it still is, you know? Do you hard surface using Zmodeler or use my? Oh, definitely Zmodeler. I used to do everything Maya, but now it's all Zmodeler. It's not just Zmodeler. I do live booleans as well. I use Bevel Pro for a lot of things. I use everything in conjunction as well. Some panel loops here and there. Noise, surface noise for like small little patterns. And, and a lot of morph targets with chisel brush too for panel lines and so yeah there's a lot of things here in ZBrush that people don't know most people not, I'm not telling I'm not saying you guys because some of you I know follow me for a while um, and some of you know me personally so uh, th but a lot of people don't re even realize that ZBrush can do so much more especially when it comes to hard surface modeling. A lot of people come from that old school 3DS Max sort of way of working. I'm, I'm saying 3DS Max, but it's not just 3DS Max. It's because 3DS Max was the de facto go to, go to for so many years for hard surface modeling and game art that people just became so accustomed to that workflow that they think that there's no way you can get that quality on anything else than that particular workflow box modeling everything very very much uh, a very traditional sort of box modeling sort of way to go about it right and that's not true that's simply not true i found that i found out when i was studying under paul and that changed my life definitely like just the hard surface part right I took a course on hard surface modeling at the time and uh, with Paul Gabry and uh, he showed me the ropes on what can be done in ZBrush for hard surface. Whoops, lazy. Jesus, I really need to get a new tablet. Sorry. 
Alright, there we go. Gotta turn the IQ curve off for now. I don't want that to go to a point. Alright, so now, actually, let, let's mask this again. BM2. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a valid it's it's a valid workflow. Don't get me wrong. It's it, and it's the same, let's say, workflow than Z modeler, but because it's box modeling, right? But the difference is that since ZBrush has a lot of other features that use polygroups and use a lot of like from projections to life boolean, etc. You can just get away with a lot of stuff. And even Z modeler, I would argue that's me. You know, I've been doing Maya before I was using ZBrush. I was a self-taught Maya artist for eight years. And so for me to switch from a Maya centered workflow to Z modeler was like a, an ex I had an existential crisis at the time, right? But I forced myself to do it uh, for Paul's class. And uh, at the end, I was like, why the heck do I even use Maya for? This is way faster. And not just faster, it gives me better results because I can so I can so quickly go back and change stuff. And it's not destructive. A lot of the workflows are not as destructive as a typical insert edge loop kind of thing. You know, uh, that it's just, it's just a different way, right? Yeah, that, that's it. Like wrapping your head around it is, is the, the hardest part, right? So uh, wrapping your head around because it's a different mindset, right? It's a different workflow. You're dealing with a brush. You're not dealing with tools. You're not cutting edges. You're not thinking of like end guns and stuff like that. You know what I mean? So it's a different mindset. Uh, but Z modeler, uh, basically, I took I took Paul's Nomon School work um, class. Is uh, it's it was called Advanced Digital Sculpting at Nomon School of Visual Effects, and it was online because we were doing the pandemic, right? And I was in Portugal, stuck at home, and uh, so I took his class. But I know that he's he uh, we he did a workshop on his own mentorship thing, mentorship program that's called Sculpt Corner, and we're all part of it. Well, not we're all. I'm part of it. There's a couple of other friends in the industry that are part of it, and. Uh, and Paul did the first workshop. It's basically a lifetime mentorship, right? You pay once and you get access to every workshop he ever does. And uh, and he did a workshop. The first workshop was like 20 weeks or something. And it was the same thing, just hard surface techniques in ZBrush. And you have to trust me when I tell you that even if you're an organic sculptor, if you understand how to do hard surface and the multitude of features that you are required to know to do cool hard surface pieces in ZBrush, you know ZBrush, that's it. You know ZBrush, because for organic sculpting like this, you can get away with just a couple of tools and you can do that too in hard surface, but there's so much more features, so many features that are sort of hidden under this, this glass ceiling that's called the hard surface uh, blockade. You know that most people can't get through but it's it, it is easier than you think it's just a it's just it, it just has a steep learning curve right in the beginning but that's with everything right anything CG is not easy right so really to see modeler oh I was just wondering how do you change the top right avatar like yeah we, I did I went through that on the beginning of the stream if you want to watch that I I told you guys to watch the VOD or this stream is going to be recorded so that's going to be there and there's also a video from Ian let me let me see if I can find that video from Ian um, let me just check so cam view Ian Robinson I remember Ian Robinson Where's the cam view? There you go. Gonna post that on chat. Oh God, this is two years ago. Okay. 
ZBrush 21.6. So let me just post that on chat. Oh, what? This isn't it. <laughs> okay, this is it. There we go. Uh, wrap my head around the model. I use 3ds Max. Hard to think outside the box and get in there. Let's zoom version a little bit Yes. So, okay. So I put the link up and uh, really appreciate you taking the time. Oh, no problem at all, man. I used to do this for a living, like five for five years. <laughs> I was a teacher. Just answering questions was my my bread and butter, and I really enjoy doing it. So you're welcome. That's it's it's cool. I like doing that. So, I mean, just try to fly through this a little bit, because to be honest, I don't want you guys to just watch me sculpting rocks for weeks on end. I'm going to finish this up so I can show you cool things in ZBrush that, well, this is cool. I like this, you know, but there's a lot more cool things that I'm going to do that are applicable. Even if you're not an environment artist, and even if you're not doing it for games, whoa, crazy brush stroke there. Let's just clip this. And, uh, well, it's a skill that's learnable as well, right? You learn it with, with not just with experience, but with, uh, also with with a lot of persistence and uh, I mean I come from a country with no industry right so it was really really hard for me to get into the industry um, and uh, and teaching was a viable option to make ends do right but I fell I fell in love with it <laughs> actually you know like I really enjoyed teaching and I felt like I was doing the the actual country some good because what I see is in a lot of these uh, developed countries in terms of industry, right? Because Portugal is not a developed country, but it has no industry. In in the industry of games and VFX, etc., uh, Portugal is definitely an underdeveloped country. <laughs> you know what I mean? So uh, I saw a lot of people just give up on 3D modeling and concept art and all those cool things because there was no industry, right? And because there weren't a lot of people teaching them the skills, right? Necessary. Like they would teach them software, they wouldn't teach them skills. And even software is like, you know, people that are not from the industry trying to teach people that want to get in the industry. And to be fair, I wasn't in the industry too. But I knew a lot of people from the industry. I knew how things worked in the industry because I was attending events. I was attending the Trojan Horse was a Unicorn event at the time. And I'm still, I still am, you know. Uh, and that alone gives you a, a sensibility to what the industry requires you to have in terms of skills and etc. right? And I knew Substance Painter, ZBrush, a little bit of ZBrush, a little bit of Maya. Uh, and uh, Maya was my go-to, right? An Unreal Engine. So I was teaching that for a few years and um, and a lot of students seemed to enjoy the classes. And I felt like a lot of people didn't give up on going to the industry because I tried to make that the focus of my classes, right? I didn't want people to just think, oh, this is great, but this is not gonna get me paid or you know or there's no way I can make it because I'm in Portugal or whatever so you know that, that because it's a it's a darn reality in most of these countries there's a cool podcast that's called edge loop the guy he was the art director or lead can't remember on Ghost of Tsushima and he, he talks about this issue numerous times because he comes from Iran right and Iran is even worse than Portugal, right? There's a lot of countries that, that's, that are worse than Portugal. But it's a good example of like a country that has no industry, right? And, uh, and then a, a person that really is clearly passionate about this industry, a particular industry, but overall like the entertainment industry, 
and they have to they really really want to to have that be the bread and butter of their life and that's a fair assumption i mean if you grow up and you really like i don't know like you really really wanted to be a doctor there's all these like possibilities for you to study and you can go and have a successful career well it's not easy it's not easy definitely not easy but um but it is more tangible like a student can clearly see the path right from starting as a student to becoming a doctor right and they know it's not easy because everything up to that point was sort of um uh it, it led them to believe that it, it's not easy and it is not right so my job as a teacher was always to try to bridge that gap right to to let students know that there's a way to have to be happy career wise and do what you love uh regardless if you're in a country like portugal or whatever or brazil or whatever that, that has not a lot of like studios or maybe not a lot of like opportunities for teaching actually brazil is way better off than portugal right now when it comes to teaching there's a lot of schools that are cg and with a lot of cool artists there's a lot of talent coming from brazil like especially when it comes to modeling um not just Rafael Grossetti and Carolina. There's a bunch of, like, literally a lot of modelers and, and artists that come out of Brazil. And, uh, of course, some of them are self-taught. But nowadays, I feel there's a lot more awareness, let's say, in Brazil than there is in Portugal. Uh, some of my Brazilian friends can testify to that. But, you know. But again, so my job was always to try to bridge that gap. Right between environment, uh, between being a student in a country that has no industry and being a, a professional working in the industry, right? Oh, thank you. Yeah, Marcia was my t my my student. She was my student for a year. I live in the Philippines, so I can total. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like it's very hard unless you're like in some countries in Europe, like France, Germany, uh, Spain is becoming huge. It will be huge because there's a lot of studios opening opening up in Barcelona, particularly Barcelona, and the UK, of course. Like UK is the major destination for VFX games, particularly games. It has a good, a huge tradition of game development since the 90s right and uh and um and the us of course us and canada but outside of that it's just it's hard to 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 actually you know make it let's see if i can let me try to do some shenanigans here. All right, maybe I can raise my Dynamesh now, just a tad. Mm -hmm. Last time we were enjoying a knife on a rock. It's the same. Yeah, it's it's the same project. I'm just doing a flatter shape formation um, for the rocks, because I feel like that would differentiate it from other projects that I have. So I have a flatter sort of rock shape formation. You can actually connect these two like so. You can see there they are still still separate meshes. And this is ideal for dynamesh purposes. But you know, because you can still retain a lot of, of that detail. Let's hope. 
I can come up with something fairly cool in such a short amount of time. Let's go. Yeah, this side is still pretty blocky. Dude, I definitely need a a Cintiq or something. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, it's a rock formation. It's a rock formation and that's going to be sort of duplicated and rotated in the engine to create a cool organic environment. Well, okay. There we go. And I want to actually let me go start sculpting up. So you can do right. Whoops, not this one. Whoops, that was too much. Actually, this is all a little too much. Right, this doesn't work. Actually, let me go mount fast. Mallet fast is a little better to do this this edge wear thing, but I'm still tapping on it. It's just that it's a little more organic ish. You can see what's happening. It's basically not flattening the plane. Let me. Flattening up and do some clips here. Whoops. Over there. Clipping this like so. Whoops. Like that. And then we can start tweaking the overall shape of the environment because it's still looking too blocky very hard to tell what's going on big planes first uh, sometimes your brain just goes into tunnel vision Enjoying this this section. There's two of them. Maybe we don't need two of them. So maybe I can just clear this up. Like straight cut there. And now uh, do those shenanigans. Well, okay. Whoops, a daisy. Whoops. All right, maybe I just need to fill this in. Still doing that. Yep. 
back face mask. Just to fill that in. So it's not as thin there. I can just trim this. This looks weird. This could be maybe pushed like so. Or maybe I can just use some deformers here. Again, deformers also work with the mask. Well, no, I don't use, uh, um, I don't use HD geometry because I'm, I don't need to. Because this is eventually going to be baked anyway into a um, fairly low resolution texture. Well, it's not low resolution. It's like 4K, right? But so unless you're doing and you're doing that extra, usually a lot of like character artists do that, right? Because you're baking like the HD geometry subdivisions into like a, a detail map, right? But when it comes to this, usually what I do is I have a bunch of tiling textures that I use for my detail maps in the engine. So it's not something I do in the model itself because there's no need for that. You're gonna lose that anyway due to, you know, the resolution of the texture, especially on big models like this, you know. Any suggestions on doing sci-fi and spaceships? Yes, just go learn Z Modeler. <laughs> go watch Paul's, uh, there's another one from from Paul that I always suggest. There's the TIE Fighter, right? There's this TIE Fighter in, that's a two-part thing. And the spaceship, there's a spaceship as well. There's a spaceship series, actually. Uh, alien dropship from Alien, you know. Hard surface sci-fi. All right, I'm gonna put put those in. So this is the Tie Fighter. Tie Fighter is right there. And uh, second part of the Tie Fighter. And then there's the drop ship. And more drop ship. But if you really want to know a little bit of like everything, let's say, involved in doing hard surface, there's one single video that's like really cool. That's basically the helmet, this Celtic helmet that he did. I mean, when it comes to hard surface, you know, there's like no one like Paul, in my opinion. Like just this, this the, the sheer amount of knowledge that he has on on ZBrush, it's insane, you know. So let me see, helmet. Well, there's there's Marco Plufa. He's also great, incredible, actually. But when it comes to like actual, because he's a great teacher as well. Like Paul is a great teacher. So those are all the links for the streams, actually. That Paul did uh that go into a hard surface but i would advise you yes learn zbrush learn z modeler actually and learn how to use live bullions to your advantage and and then morph targets and there's a bunch of brushes like imms are super important when it comes to doing hard surface workflows how to create your own imms like imm patterns let's say nano mesh is always useful as well array mesh for some things. So there's a bunch of features there that you that you would need to go into. We are going to go into them, but not for those purposes. So let me just see if I missed any questions. Mm -mm -mm. 
Look, I am looking for three guys. John, I graduated from college two months ago, but somehow I'm not getting a job. What is it? Oh, man, it's possible. Okay, no, no. Well, I can take a look. Just send me over that through Instagram, or I'm gonna link that on the. You can send it over through Instagram. And. Uh, We have a Discord channel in the works as well, by the way, guys. So for now, just hit me over on Instagram and send me over your portfolio if you wanna if you wanna have reviews. That would be cool, actually. There it is. I linked it. It's on the it's on the chat. So I don't know, I don't know. yeah, looking for a job is hard, man. I've been there, I still am, because I'm a freelancer. So a freelancer is always on the lookout for jobs, because uh, you never know, right? So it, it is hard, man. I, there's no way, I can't really say anything unless, uh, just keep doing what you're doing and, and it will happen. You know, eventually if you push through, it's a mix of like portfolio with, uh, with also like your networking, because that's the reality of it. And then eventually it will happen, dude. I'm pretty confident that the industry, the industry is going through a rough phase now with the layoffs and the unionization in Hollywood and all of the stuff that's happening with the Hoppenheimer film, you know? So there's a few things that are happening in the industry that are not great for junior artists that are looking to get into the industry. But it is a, a phase, like mostly like everything, everything just goes back to normal, reverts back to normal eventually. And it, it, that's how it goes, you know. Let me just, uh, whoops. Push this back a little bit there. And uh, read Dynamesh. So this is coming together here on this side. Whoops. Fill this in. Eventually I'm gonna start the stylization because it's still looking a little rough and I wanna clean up a lot of these edges. We're going mallet fast two. Now one. Eventually this is too noisy for a stylized piece, but you can clean that up after the fact. For now, I'm starting, I'm trying to think of, in terms of the game, right, or the environment, how am I going to use this for different um, applications. to this. Come on. There we go. Mm -mm -mm. Unity I can model and animate inside of Unity without any other I haven't seen that nude. I mean I'm not I'm not against AI uses for um speeding up workflows like Unreal has been using AI for meta humans and a lot of other stuff for a bunch of years now, nobody complained, right? But 
I can understand that there are some issues when it comes to copyright, right? When it comes to like stuff like Mid Journey and stuff like that, right? But that said, I'm not against AI because I think it is a tool, like mostly everything. So that's my opinion. So I don't think that jobs are going to be lost uh, in the long run. Maybe in the beginning, a little bit, but not as much as people think. So think about it. You're a company, right? And you have 10 artists. And you can make one game every five years. Right? With 10 artists and developers. So you can make one game in five years. And then suddenly there's AI. And AI can make that same game in, in one year. You have an option, right? You either keep your artists. And now, instead of making one game every five years, you can make two games every year or you fire your artists and you can only make one game a year right so it's like it's never going to go away it's not like ai is going to replace uh, the artist it's going to add to it of course there are companies that you know that abuse that and 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 fire artists and all that but they're not thinking on the long run and the very very long run you're going to benefit from having both both the uh, artists and AI working together to optimize workflows, to make everything faster for the artist. And the artist does that, what he does, or he or she. And then the AI comes in and speeds up their workflow. That's it. That's what I think it is. And again, no sense in worrying about careers and all of that. Um, because there's nothing you can do. Like to be honest, there's nothing you can do unless it's uh, legislation to regulate copyright. That's the only thing I think should be done. Uh, regulate copyright issues, and other than that, it's like it's just what it is. You know, learn Unreal. That's what I'm always saying. Learn Unreal, learn ZBrush, and there's no AI that's gonna replace that in the world. No AI that's gonna replace sculpting by hand. And no AI can replace um, you knowing how to work the AI. You knowing how to work procedural systems. You knowing how to work with a tech, right? Because there's always technicians behind the AI, right? So if you think about it, there's jobs there. So there's a lot of other you know, stuff going on. Yeah, like in a smaller market, like the indie game development scene and all that, sort of. But I can also tell you right now that most indie developers like to have an handcrafted sort of look to their projects. That's the whole point of them going indie because they can be a lot more creative, right? So to be honest, the indie small studio, I'm talking about games, of course, right? The indie small studio uh, phenomena is not going to go away because of AI. I honestly think that it's actually going to enhance it because most indie developers are actually concerned about the artistic side of their games, right? That's why they're indie. They're not working in major AAA titles and all that because they want to have their own vision into the game. They're not doing indie games for the money. I could tell you that because that's not where the money is. It, there's some money, but that's not where the big bucks are. And so it's like, you know, why would you do AI and replace the artist if the whole point of you having a Hindi studio is to have your own artistic voice into a particular game or a particular franchise? You know what I mean? It's like, it makes no sense. Right, this is... Starting 
need to look. Yes, that's true. I agree with that. There's no way to replace that. And even if you could, again, it's a matter of like business, right? If you think of it in a business perspective, it doesn't make sense for you to replace the artist. You can just have the same amount of salaries that you had before, but now you can pour out twice or three times the amount of work because the artists have AI. So all you need to do is actually train the artists to use AI in conjunction to their own, you know, handcrafted artwork. And there you go, you have a winning formula. So even from a business perspective, it doesn't make sense, right? It all depends on your perspective, again. What I think is that there's a lot of businessmen, let's call them, I don't think they are, but you know, that saw AI as like this, uh, you know, trend, let's say, and they want to capitalize on the short term with it, you know, investing in AI and then just sell them when the trend is not there anymore. And that is how it works. And that is great. But at the same time, it's not going to be representative of the, the actual future of AI, especially when the government starts regulating the copyright things you know there's no copyright law for AI to protect the artists so I mean there are companies I can tell you that that are doing incredible stuff uh, regarding that front you know the AI the um, copyright front can't really tell you anything else but I know there are companies big companies that are doing incredible work and there's there's stuff that's gonna happen that's gonna change the the way you guys publish artwork online so you can protect yourselves legally against like copyright infringement and all of that so that is gonna be exciting because it will finally fix a lot of issues particularly for 3d artists because there's no way to to copyright a model you know what I mean like you can copyright images uh, at the moment but like a model is very very hard to copyright as a single individual artist I don't know maybe I'm wrong just let me know if, if there's a way because I'm dying to to know <laughs> you know there is a way but it's like if you're part of a company right and the company's assets are copyrighted that includes the 3d models but it's like as an individual artist that's just, you know, online doing artwork. That's a different story. And even for artists that are already established in the industry. I know Carlo Ortiz uh, went to the Senate in the United States to testify for legislation um, against AI copyright infringement. And I see it as a good thing, to be honest, that artists are starting to let them know that we need this to be regulated, right? Because again, it's just a tool. AI has been there for a while. 
people seem to forget that AI has always been there. This kind of AI, I mean, it's just not been as available to the public as it was now. This is called generative models, right? Retopo my model. The model is too big for Retopo. You can have an idea. What do you mean too big for Retopo? You mean the actual scale of it, or or the what do you mean, like bi too big for Retopo? Yeah, it's not about about the look because AI changes the look because it's using a data bank that's comprised of work that is available online, that a work that is or not copyrighted, right? So that's why AI works. This is not true AI per se, like, you know, Skynet. This is literally a huge data bank that uses a search engine to search for images. And then it's, it's intelligent in a way that it associates images with words, with prompts, right? That's literally the AI part, associating images that are available online with words and then mix and matching them in a specific logic of color and harmony and all that right but the images that it's sourcing it from are copyrighted you know that's the tricky part and that's that's what needs to be uh, regulated like the images that it sources uh, the the prompt from right that usually is the i think it's the main complaint about uh, ai nowadays so, because I'm not against AI, again, I told you, I'm not at all against AI. It's just um, the copyright works that it's using, I think it's not fair for artists to have their copyrighted works uh, being used by some random program online that's not even crediting them, right? So it's not about what the AI does, it's where it's getting that information from and reusing it and changing it to make a profit. And the artist doesn't get a dime, right? All right, and I fear that we are not gonna be able to finish today again. I'm so sorry, guys. Like when I'm online and this happened as well when I was teaching, I'm never as fast as I could be when I'm on my own doing work and I feel that's natural right so and it's very hard for me to work on this outside of the streams because I have a job and I'm freelancing so I can't really sometimes I can but I'm so tired you know like from working all day doing this all day for other projects that uh that I just don't feel like it at the end of the day. But sometimes I can. I manage to do some work for my own after the fact. And this is still not finished, clearly. But it's looking like a rock. It's no longer this, right? This is what we started with, sort of. And this is what we got at the moment. The shape is still pretty much similar. But it is supposed to be you know they're supposed to be like this cut here for example supposed to have a cut there so it actually looks like there's intersection in the rocks this doesn't work so there we go whoops And now it's the part, the fun part, right? Where we start to actually look at this and start to break the geometrical aspect of it, but still keeping it fairly simple. And this is where, whoops, I feel we can sort of leave it at. So next week I'm still doing it on my channel, doing the stream on my channel, and we're gonna go through some more non-ZBrush related stuff. We could still do some ZBrush stuff. This is what I feel would be great to do. 
to do to have like a bunch of like ZBrush streams going on, and then have a bunch of like Unreal Engine stuff going on. So, so I'm looking towards making this a finished, at least to a point where I can even decimate it and bring it into the engine. So I feel that's what's missing at the moment, right? Because we have 15 minutes left. This has been, time is flying. Again, like environment art is not something you can just do on a whim in terms of like speed, right? There's a lot to take into account there. This needs to be on all angles sort of working. Try this. Yeah, so my channel is. Let me go to the Twitch. I'm gonna link it down below. Uh, Twitch and YouTube. Whoops, this is the wrong. This is the old channel. It's still there. The VOD for last week's uh, stream is still there. But, um,. But uh, it's gonna go away, and if it does, there's the YouTube channel. Let me just go over here. Mm. Let me see. Mm, what? How come I can't find it? Yeah, I'm gonna have to sign in. Stories. There we go. And there we go. And that's the YouTube channel. Uh, so there's some minimalist in game in various places. There are even a huge place just the time. They're even a huge place or just a type of rock. Yeah, exactly. So this is made this sort of like blocky shape. I think I feel it's better for complementing like cliffs and stuff like that in open world environments. Because then you have your actual terrain, right? Underneath this. And you can do a lot of like fake variations and stuff like that using this method. And I'm trying to this looks odd. <laughs> I mean, I just enjoy sculpting rocks. I don't know why. A, a lot of people find this very, very tedious and 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 uh, and not just tedious, but hard. And it is hard. Don't get me wrong, but I love it. I just love it. I love to sculpt rocks. And here we go. Again, just cover this up. Again, this all this scratchiness here. That's, that's what you gotta think. Like, when you're sculpting rocks, you gotta be down and dirty. Like, you have to be dirty on your sculpting. Like, the way that you approach the sculpt has to be a little bit of a... in a, a fine art kind of way. So you have to sculpt it like you would a portrait. Not a character, a portrait. You know what I mean? Like, like you're doing clay sculpting. You have to sort of look at it and imagine that you're doing... Uh, a clay sculpture so it's dirty and then you refine it as you go always think of the big shapes first then the smaller shapes then the minute shapes so the hierarchy of detail that's super important and uh, oh no we have 10 minutes ah uh, I wanted the stream to be longer actually <laughs> but I can't there's there's more streamers coming in Saturday. Saturday is a busy day. So you guys can enjoy ZBrush Live the entire Saturday if you want. It's a show, you know, it's our own little ITV. I feel a lot of people that watch YouTube on, and Twitch like me, you know, they don't watch TV. This is our TV, you know what I mean? <laughs> so, so it's great, right? I don't really watch TV. I just watch Twitch, YouTube and 
so whoa what happened there oh okay it's it's flattening that shape whoa yeah but you can see like i'm, I'm still in dynamesh still in dynamesh but it's uh, a little easier to control because i have all these polygroups uh this polygroup section and then you have these little cuts here which you could take advantage whoops which you can take advantage oh, come on there we go oh let me down see that and that one of the cool things is that you can actually Ma mask this or you can actually start smoothing this and maybe flatten this up a little bit see what's going on there like as you break up this edge there and these natural formations starting start to emerge in a way you know, and you can always just come over here, mask, and then, whoops, and then you want to mask this one too, you can add to the mask, and now you can go over here with a move infinite depth, and just move that slightly off. And in this, in this case, we might want AccuCurve on, and you can edit the curve as well. Uh, that's something like that. So it breaks up. It's it was a straight line, right? You wanna rake it up. <laughs> that's true. That's true, man. Some people do drugs. ZBrush users make rocks. That's that's so true. That's my that's my mantra. <laughs> uh, anime style games like Zelda and Genshin Impact. Yeah, exactly. It's satisfying while. Well, craving and add layer objects yeah yeah definitely there's layers then that we're gonna go through as well on how to use layers and morph targets to create detail uh how do we join proper layer like brush it's good with well yeah yeah how do we join the stream like this? well yeah well, you mean the you mean when i stream on my own channel that's that's a separate channel that's not super slight because it's usually centered around more like non uh, ZBrush workflows as well, like how to use other software in conjunction with ZBrush to uh, to create environments. So when I'm doing a lot of like Unreal work, I'm not going to do that in ZBrush Live. You know what I mean? Like, so I saw Rolfo. I'm going to be looking for. Oh, cool! Thank you, thank you so much, Michael Mitchell. Sorry, I butchered that. <laughs> Sorry, Mitchell. Matt DiVetro, some people do drugs, yeah. Mitchell again, at or addicting than anything on planet Earth. You mean drugs or, or rocks? Because to me, that's rocks. <laughs> Sculpting rocks is the most addictive thing <laughs> you could actually. You want to give me a drug? Give me a rock to sculpt. You know what I mean? <laughs> and this conversation has become weird all of a sudden. You know? Okay, uh, I really want to carry on with this, but unfortunately, we're, let me just do a quick save, <laughs> just in case. Um, unfortunately, it, we have to leave in like five minutes, so we don't have uh, any conflicting schedules and all of that. And uh, another cool thing we can do is actually come over here to the slash, the orb brushes, right? We start doing these you can see you can see that for this kind of thing it's already a little bit low poly and we don't want that so might as well just wait around for the next stage the phase two you can see this is still too blocky this is a little better here it's kind of working now sort of you know but you can definitely tell that this could be moved for example could have like a move infinite depth and just move this in you know move that in move that out a little bit the only issue with this workflow is that you can't use ghost mode because it's the same sub tool right but it 
is a better workflow for it to be non-destructive, basically. So now we can do the brush mallet too. There we go. And now we can start, you know, uh, carving in just to get that idea of a shape there. There we go. Start getting that. The, the idea of having like interlocking rocks. So that is very much reliant on the, the bottom section there. And now it's a little getting into a little tunnel vision there. So I don't, I don't want to go in too close, you know, at this stage. So I want to keep it simple, fairly big forms looking at this here. Does it still read like a big block? Yes, it does. On the angle, there's a little cut there, which I actually like. Because it adds variation and a little bump there on that section, which is cool. So it breaks up that stiffness, you know. We could break it up a little more here on the side, but I feel that's not necessary because we're either going to have this on this side, or on that side, or rotate it like this or like this. And maybe the corners on certain sections. Yeah, yeah, I'll definitely take a look at that. Don't worry. I'll take a look at that and we can go over it. Uh, if you want, we could do it. We could go over it on stream on my channel. Uh, yeah you don't want to add you mean on 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 this rock like a tribal mark or whatever is that what you mean like doing you know little runes and stuff because if that's the case you don't want to have like anything that pops out as too irregular because that's gonna be, if you repeat this over, you can already see that there's a, like a common pattern there that screams that it's the same model, you know? And you don't want that, because this is gonna be a modular sort of rock cliff, right? You wanna repeat this over and over again, and you don't want it to be evident that there's some uh, rep repetitiveness to it. That's why I use a ray mesh. I use a ray mesh because it allows me to to uh, to see if the repetition is evident, right? You can see that it's repeating and then mirroring over and etc. And you can see there's a little bit of repetition there. From the top, this looks great because it is going to be clipping over other rocks and other meshes, right? But there on the side, you can see there's like that repeating pattern there. That's why you don't want it to have a lot of like very, um, very evident uh, differences, you know, between, you don't want anything to pop out too much. You know what I mean? Because otherwise there goes your, your modularity. You'll be limited to the amount of rocks that you can repeat on the level. And you don't want that. Especially if you're making like a huge environment, like an open world environment or something. You want to make sure your rocks are well first of all you need a lot more rocks than this for that but then again they can't seem like they're too much the same if you know what i mean so that's my reasoning go we have this mesh we have that mesh start cutting out away with that we can even do this going a little crazy with that formation there I love this brush man this has become my favorite brush <laughs> is a brush mallet fast 2 it's just incredible. Uh, just cut up like that. Okay, this is the issue. This mesh right here, right? So we wanna maybe 
maybe we want this to have more of a blend there. So it's not like poking out too much. Because you have to look at this sort of like uh, the white, like the, the, the highlights and the shadows, right? So if you look at the black and white pattern there, it's fairly easy to, to realize where the issue lies. Where's the bump viewer? Uh, where's the bump viewer? There we go. So there's a very high contrast zone. That as well. Like, especially if you're looking at it up front. There's like a slash here. There's a slash there. There's a slash there. You see that? Like, that black, the darkest area. That dark area, then there's that dark area. And there's a parallel there. This is no problem, but this, that's a problem, right? Because you have like repeating slashes and that's gonna be a little evident here. If you look at it, this section, it's right there. This section, it's not as seen here, but it is here, right? So that's another thing we have to take into account when you're doing like rocks that are gonna be duplicated over and repeated and all of that. Uh, it's 3 p.m. in Portugal. 5 p.m. Sorry, in Portugal. So I guess we're at the end of our cool stream, unfortunately, because I was pretty much enjoying it. But yeah, so yeah, I hope this stream wasn't like it was useful I hope it it didn't it covered a lot of things a lot of questions you guys asked and again like feel free to reach out it's in the chat just look it over reach out to me via Instagram or on YouTube and Twitch like you can reach out to me anywhere uh, on my art station as well if you feel like there's some question particularly to art station related content so if you go to my YouTube channel, there's the Twitch. There's all my links there. You can see here. Let me give me a sec. You can see here. There's all my links there where you can reach out to me. Twitch, ArtStation, Instagram and Twitter, right? And if you have any further questions and until my next stream, well, we can do a lot of stuff on my own channel regarding this. And just to let you know that there's a discord uh, server in the works that's going to be dedicated to the streams and stream related content. And I hope I find you guys there. So I'm going to advertise it in due time when it's when it's ready. Right. So guys, I hope this was useful. I hope you guys you guys enjoyed it. It was cool spending the Saturday afternoon with you guys, just answering questions and and chilling and sharing some experiences. We talked about a lot, like AI, from AI to portfolios to rocks to drugs to everything. <laughs> and yeah, so I hope you guys enjoyed it. I'll see you next week on my channel. And until then, bye-bye.